Thank you all for being here, and it's wonderful to have been seeing, I've been watching on Twitter how this has become a sold-out event on Carbon Talks. Because Shauna went back down memory lane a little bit, I think I'll just fill in one gap, which is that uh, we were actually successful in preventing any aerial spraying in Nova Scotia. We ended up, uh, it was New Brunswick that had aerial spraying for years, so a grassroots movement in on Cape Breton Island in the mid-1970s managed to reverse plans that had been approved by the government and were accommodating very large multinational forest industries. Uh, the, the, the incident, the court case over which we lost our land, was a, an attempt to prevent the spraying of Agent Orange. And yes, Canada was continuing to defend Agent Orange, up to, right when we went to court in 1982, it had been banned in Sweden for years, banned in the U.S. for years. But Health Canada sent its uh, staff, not even on subpoena, to testify that Agent Orange was safe and that banning it in the U.S. was bad science and so on. So by the time we lost the case and we lost our land, we were primarily fighting. Scott was a, you remember Scott because they were closer to you guys. There were some sites in Muscadabit, so I was in that area too. But the, uh, the, the, uh, the major uh, defendant that carried the legal case forward was a company called Stora Kopperberg in Sweden, uh, which has since sold its mill in Nova Scotia, but only in the last couple of years. They maintained operations for a very long time thereafter. Uh, and by the time that the Nova Scotia court ruled that Agent Orange was safe, that was actually the ruling, that it had caused some damage in Vietnam, and yes, dioxin was bad when it blew up in the plant in Seveso, Italy, but everybody got well afterwards. It was a temporary thing, and we really shouldn't worry about these exaggerated claims uh, that Agent Orange was a problem. So by the time the court ruled that, uh, the United States had taken action, and a voluntary decision was made by Dow Chemical that while Agent Orange had been banned in the United States for, I think, since 1978, so this was, by this point, five years later, 1983, the U.S. EPA announced a voluntary decision by Dow Chemical to no longer export Agent Orange to countries where it was still legal. And just as a footnote that you can put in your head every time you hear someone from Health Canada tell you that all these things are safe, whatever it is, you can fill in the blanks, that you just remember the government of Canada never banned Agent Orange, never took regulatory action against it, we just uh, were no longer able to sell it when it was banned everywhere else. So as a result of that, the Agent Orange that had been purchased to spray in Nova Scotia was, um, by the time the courts ruled that it was legal to spray it, uh, the uh, company had sold the stored amounts that they'd had on hand for the two years our court case took. Uh, they'd sold it to New Brunswick. So New Brunswick became the last jurisdiction in Canada sprayed with Agent Orange. And every day in the House of Commons, I look across the benches and I see the Member of Parliament for uh, West Nova, Greg Kerr, the former Minister of Environment from Nova Scotia who authorized the permits for Agent Orange. So it's a long way in the past, but sometimes I'm reminded of it. Uh, <laughs> the issue I want to talk to you about today is obviously nothing to do with that. It is the climate crisis, where we stand uh, right now in terms of the science, what happened in Durban, and what's happened in Canada since. I want to make sure I give, I brought this device up here, not to look at other emails, but to make sure I finish on time, that we have enough time to have a really good conversation. And that's, that's one of the things that I'm most looking forward to. So I'll, I'll try to finish by the top of the hour so that we have, assuming a good half an hour to 45 minutes for conversation and questions. Because I really do, we all need each other's help. We need each other's encouragement. We need to get our facts straight. And we need to make sure that the Harper government does not get away with what it's trying to do right now, which is to pull Canada out of the Kyoto Protocol to allow greenhouse gas levels to climb and to essentially, well, to literally ignore the single greatest threat to our survival on this planet. So I've been involved in climate negotiations, as you can tell from what Shauna said. I mean, the 1992 Earth Summit to which she referred was the gathering of world leaders at which the first international legal convention was signed, subsequently ratified by over 192 or three countries. Basically, every country on the planet ratified the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's important to know that, even though it goes back 20 years ago, we signed and ratified the convention that promises that all nations that are signatories, 
will not uh, hesitate to act to reduce greenhouse gases, acknowledge that human interference with the climate system is a significant threat, acknowledges that we know what causes it, primarily burning fossil fuels, but also deforestation and land use change, commits countries from the entire, well, all of the countries on this planet have committed to ensure that greenhouse gas levels stop rising and reach a new equilibrium before the levels can become, and this is the word in the convention, dangerous. So to, uh, to ensure that the rise in anthropogenic greenhouse gases is contained before dangerous levels are reached. Now, figuring out what was dangerous has been the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was created by the United Nations back in 1988 to try to advise governmental decision makers as to what kinds of threats are faced at what different levels of emissions. Back in 1992, we still thought the 1990s were going to be the turnaround decade, that we were going to see the reduction of greenhouse gases. We had the fall of the Berlin Wall, so we also thought we'd get the peace dividend. Uh, what we missed was that with the fall of the Berlin Wall, we had an orgy of, of un <laughs> unprecedented greed and the creation of the World Trade Organization and the, uh, the new... Uh, monster of corporate rule and globalization took over in the 1990s. I mean, that's a snapshot because I want to move on to other things. But in short form, that's how we lost the peace dividend. That's how we lost progress on the climate crisis. And emissions kept rising. So by 1997, at the third conference of the parties, under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, let me just pause for a parenthesis, countries that signed and ratified the Framework Convention on Climate Change are henceforth called parties, capital P. And the treaty does not just sit there on a shelf. It creates a living governance system that is global to address the climate crisis on an annual basis. And these, if you will, climate parliaments that occur are the conference of the parties or the COPs. So ever since COP1 in Bonn in 1995, because Rio was 92, but it took a couple of years to get enough countries to ratify for the agreement to take legal force and so on. So 95 was COP1. From that very first meeting, the environment ministers who were gathered there decided that they needed a tougher agreement than the convention, one with timelines and targets that committed countries to reduce their emissions against particular deadlines. The Framework Convention, by the way, is legally binding, but without, without something that was specific to timelines and targets, emissions weren't coming down. So it was decided at COP1 in Bonn that the protocol, which is going to be the tougher agreement within the convention, the protocol for targets and timelines for greenhouse gas reductions should be modeled on the highly successful protocol to protect the ozone layer. That was the Montreal Protocol, which had been negotiated not that many years earlier. Uh, when I was working in government, I was part of the team that negotiated the Montreal Protocol, in Montreal, of course, in 1987. And it's important to know that that protocol worked brilliantly. It's been reducing, well, it's, it, it moved from its first iteration of reductions in chlorofluorocarbons and other ozone depleters to move fairly rapidly to complete removal of them. There are still too many loopholes, by the way, but it's, it's working quite well. And overall, the ozone depleters that are still around are at the terrestrial level, as they float up to the stratosphere every year, there are fewer and fewer of them, to the point where now the ozone layer is beginning to repair itself. How did we get that agreement to work? It was a principle based in equity, based in global equity, which went like this. The rich, industrialized countries have created this problem. We've been the ones using chlorofluorocarbons for refrigeration, blowing foam cups, and making insulation, and we should go first. Because we have to show the poor of the world, the developing world, that we're serious. We have superior capabilities to develop the alternatives, and it's only fair. Fairness. So in the first iteration of the Montreal Protocol, industrialized countries were required to reduce their use of these chemicals by 50%, 5-0. Developing countries were actually able to increase their use of chlorofluorocarbons by 15%, 1-5%. The goal here was that as the science got stronger, because there were still people denying the science on ozone in 1987, 
One of them was the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Don Hodel, who just before the conference said, we don't need to reduce chlorofluorocarbons and imperil the U.S. industry. We just need broad brim hats and sunscreen. There is no need to act on this issue. So it's not as if it was easy, but... Under that agreement, what happened was that we'll be informed by the science, and as the science gets stronger, we were pretty sure it would, the ratcheting down of production and use of ozone depleters will be ramped up. Worked a treat. No problems at all. 1997 in Kyoto, they tried the same. As I said, it was just, the architecture was chosen in 95 at COP1. Now, I may be belaboring this a lot, but the, the problem is that the spin that's been put on it subsequently is, well, China and India refused to sign. You need to know, for Kyoto, they were never asked to sign because the architecture of the protocol was replicated from what had just worked not long ago and was working well, the 1987 Montreal Protocol on, on ozone. So fast forward to the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, at that point, every nation was prepared to, and the industrialized world was prepared to take on targets, but we got to negotiate our own targets. So Canada had a relatively weak target compared to other countries. Jean Chrétien was convinced we'd get even more wiggle room by getting credit for forests and credit for selling reactors to China and so on. Uh, but the European Union was always pushing for the deeper targets. What's happened since, of course, has been a tragedy. The first level of tragedy started with George Bush being elected, or, or at least uh, claiming the presidency <laughs> after the election in the year 2000, uh, and surprising many people, actually surprising people, by pulling out of the Kyoto process and not ratifying. The U.S. was expected to ratify, and Bush never said anything about not ratifying during the election. He even had a better climate plan than Al Gore, although Al Gore doesn't like to talk about that. Uh, that was a huge order tragedy because ratifying Kyoto and getting it to come into force required that 55 countries had to ratify, and those 55 countries had to be the equivalent of 55% of greenhouse gas emissions in 1990. So when the U.S. walked, it walked with 25% of global emissions from 1990, making it that much harder to hit the 55% target. But somehow the world rallied. Canada was part of that rallying, saying we're going to ratify Kyoto anyway. We need every country that has any level of emissions, even Canada's relatively small 3%. You need that 3% to get to the 55% target. Canada was pressured hard by the Bush administration, railed against by Ralph Klein, and yet we ratified. We ratified the convention in this country because of a grassroots coalition that included all major communities of faith, it included all major trade union groups. It included the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, included the environmental movement, and so on. We got our government to do what we wanted, even though they were quaking in their boots. And it's true. Chrétien had no idea how he was going to reach the targets. But then we went to work to try to get them to put forward the plan that would reach the targets. We didn't get that plan, speaking of tragedies, till April 2005, when Stéphane Dion had become environment minister. And then we got a pretty good plan. It had all the elements. It would have gotten us really close to Kyoto. And so for, I'm not here to defend the liberals because they waited till 2005 to put forward a good plan. But on November 28, 2005, two really important things happened in this chronology. One was the opening of the first ever Conference of the Parties on North American soil. Canada hosted COP11 in Montreal. And Stéphane Dion was president of the COP because he's our prime, he was our uh, Minister of Environment, and the Minister of Environment, or sometimes Minister of Foreign Affairs for the host country, has to run the whole negotiation, and it's not an honorary position. It's, uh, at times, it's a 24-hour job going around, trying to get people to agree, corridor talks, twisting arms, and running a convention that's fair and transparent so that the smallest developing countries that show up with one or two delegates can be sure that nothing's going on behind their backs. That happened November, November 28th. So did the decision of the NDP, Stephen Harper, and the bloc to bring down the Martin government, which is probably why most Canadians never saw anything about COP11 happening in Montreal. CBC didn't bother to send a reporter, neither did the Globe and Mail. They were all out covering the campaign. And when Stephen Harper became prime minister at the end of that election, he immediately canceled the climate plan from April 2005, 
pulled all the IPCC science off the Environment Canada websites and announced that Canada had no intention whatsoever to try to reach our targets. So Stephen Harper's personal antipathy to the Kyoto Protocol is not a surprise. It's been clear from the beginning. Clearly, the Alliance members of Parliament all voted against ratification. And at the time, Stephen Harper was sending letters to his supporters asking for donations to, sco to stop the Kyoto Protocol, which he described as a socialist scheme. I'm not sure if the Conservatives know what socialism means, because um, recently Joe Oliver described billionaire George Soros as a billionaire socialist. And he didn't make his billions being a socialist. He made them being a capitalist. So I suppose if you're a capitalist who questions the benefits of capitalism, you are automatically an enemy of Canada and probably a socialist. And beyond that, of course, we now, I just was looking at today's news, thanks to my friend Tom, who drew my attention to the fact that at the opening of the Davos Economic Summit, the founder, Klaus Schwab, started by saying, capitalism in its current form does not fit the world we live in. But as much as I'd like to go down that road, I want to bring you up to date on Durban. So emissions kept rising and kept rising, although little covered in Canada was the news that the European Union as a group have completely met their Kyoto targets and largely exceeded them. The collective target for the EU was 8% below 1990 levels by the year 2012, and most European countries are 20 to 25% below 1990 levels. And that's why they're ramping up for the next phase to go even deeper in their emission reductions. But the the tragedy that followed in terms of the, the, the progress and barriers to progress for the Kyoto Protocol, in many ways, nearly as significant as George Bush keeping the U.S. out of Kyoto was Stephen Harper declaring Canada the enemy of Kyoto. We went into every cop after that trying to block progress. I've watched how our delegates do it, how our negotiators do it doesn't look very dramatic. They just sit in the room and wait till the negotiations on one of many subtopics, and there are reams of subtopics. Every single COP, there are negotiations on adaptation, finance mechanisms, transfer of technology, land use protection of forestry. It goes on and on and on. But in each of those rooms, there's a Canadian, and they wait till there's almost consensus, and when time is just about up, they put the flag up and say, oh, so I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, but the government of Canada would like to place square brackets around paragraphs 2 to 4 inclusive, 7 to 8, as well as, and so on and so forth. And every reference to the year 2020, we'd like square brackets around that. And we want square brackets. So square brackets mean in UN talk, none of this is agreed upon. But if you've been sitting in the room and heard this lovely, you know, I'm trying to be the dulcet tones of a defate bureaucrat, but they, it doesn't look dangerous unless you know what they're doing. So that's why Canada, every single year since Stephen Harper's been our prime minister, at every cop that's taken place, you know, there's been, as you can tell, there's good cops and bad cops. The, the last good cop was the one in Montreal thanks to Stéphane Dion, where the world agreed we would go to a second commitment period under Kyoto, we'd get it negotiated under a deadline of 2009 to make sure we had time to get it back to capitals and ratify it, so it'd be ready to go by January 1st, 2013, when the first commitment period under Kyoto runs out. But the Kyoto Protocol, of course, doesn't run out. It's full, it's an architecture for further agreements, it's just that the target timetable was first commitment period, 2008 to 2012. Every meeting since then, Canada has received the fossils of the day every, almost every day, so that at the end of every COP since 2005, Canada has had more black marks for having done the most of any country in the room. By the way, fossils of the day, Canadian media doesn't always get this, they are not an attack on the tar sands, although they could be. They're not an attack on the fact that Canada has dropped its climate targets and is doing nothing except boosting emissions. They are a specific accounting of what country that day in the negotiations has done the most unhelpful things. So we've received what's called the colossal fossil at the end. Of, it's, a numerical, it's a numerical process of just adding up who's done the most to harm the convention. And every year since we've had a delegation under Harper's instructions, we've, we've been that country. 
when I first went to COPS after Harper became prime minister, there was a look of sadness on people's faces. They'd approach you and they'd say, it was as if we'd be talking about a mutual friend. Uh, it was an interesting analogy that struck me as being exactly right. Jack Knox, in today's Times colonist, in a column about Canada becoming global bad boy, says, you know, for a lot of the countries of the world, it's like finding Tom Hanks smoking crack and trying to interest children in prostitution. Like, <laughs> what happened to Canada? You used to be so nice. You were such a good country. So people would look at me, at, you know, with sadness, right? And it started in Cancun at the last COP, and it was particularly noticeable this year in Durban. There's no longer a look of sadness or empathy or concern for what's happening to Canada. We're hated. There's no easy way to say it. I went to this COP, and it was my first time as a federal member of parliament to attend a conference of the parties on climate. I had, as you can imagine, expected I'd be on the Canadian delegation because opposition members of parliament are always traditionally on the delegations. There was a brief period when Harper kept them off, but as soon as Jim Prentice became the Minister of Environment, he put opposition members back on. So I figured, anyway, there's a lot more discussion to that, and I'll make it short, but in, in any event, I went to the Conference of the Parties in Durban, COP17, as a member of the government delegation of Papua New Guinea. That was how I could get in the right rooms, was to ask the lead negotiators for Tuvalu and Papua New Guinea if they could use me at all as an advisor, because the Canadian government wasn't taking any opposition members. And when people, and I, this is apropos in terms of how people treat Canada, when people first met me, if they didn't know me from previous cops, because there's sometimes, there's a sense that, you know, you know a lot of people, you know, if you haven't seen Shauna in so long, you know, it's good to see everybody. Uh, I always have the feeling at these conferences that it's like a family reunion on the Titanic. You know, you're, you're really happy to see everybody, but it's not a good occasion. So, so people who hadn't met me before would look at my badge and say, oh, Papua New Guinea. And I'd say, actually, I'm a member of parliament from Canada. And they'd say, oh, you. you pe what's wrong with you people? What are you even doing here? There's real rage. And part of it was, of course, because the rumors were out before we got to Durban. And this was, by the way, I think, a quite official unofficial, real, live leak for which someone in senior levels of government probably risked their job to get the information to CTV News that Canada was planning to legally withdraw from Kyoto after the meeting was over. That they planned to legally withdraw from Kyoto in um, dis late December, or December 23rd. Well, that word reached Durban just as COP17 was getting underway, and there was tremendous concern. It cast a real pall on the negotiations. I mean, everybody knew because we've now become predictably the worst country in the room. We vie for that honor with Saudi Arabia. Nobody expects in UN meetings anymore that Canada is going to be anything other than in the way. But that we would legally withdraw from the protocol was really shocking. So when I would, and of course, the um, Minister of Environment, Peter Kent, I don't know if any of you saw his interviews following the CTV leak, where people would ask him, are you going to, can you confirm, can you get an I, it was There was a, an amazing interview where I think he spent a good minute um, going through the writhing of, of facial expressions, trying to come up with an answer that would not betray the plan. But he actually, it was really, I really had to feel sorry for him because he was totally twisting the wind there. And he finally came up with, Today's not the day. Okay, so another day might be the day. When we got to Durban, I had met heads of delegations say to me, we keep wanting to ask Canada, what are you even doing in the room? Are you really going to legally withdraw? Because all you're doing here is weakening the protocol for the second commitment period that we know we must have. So what happened in Durban? The opening, other than the really significant poll cast by the news from Canada, the biggest news, and it was a bit of a surprise, was that China opened with what was essentially a public relations gambit. I'm noticing you. There's a perfectly good seat in the front row. Why don't you sit down and be comfortable? No, it's all right. You'll be much better off there. And I, I'm only going to talk for another couple hours. It's best to be seated. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful what you are saying. Oh, thank you. So... What happened in the very first Chinese public relations gambit, which, by the way, had a lot to do with the fact that China was unfairly blamed for what had happened in Copenhagen, which was a complete 
train wreck of a disastrous meeting. And it betrayed a comp it created such a lack of trust between uh, the, the global south and the elite polluter group. I mean, it really wrecked things, and I blame the Danish government. But I can get to that in questions if you're interested. But in Durban, China started by saying, we're prepared to take on targets and timetables and reductions of emissions, but we have a condition. There must be a second commitment period under Kyoto. So, of course, Peter Kent had gone to Durban saying, Canada will not agree to a second commitment period under Kyoto, which is different, by the way, from legal withdrawal. And this takes a lot of grappling with the detail. Uh, because, he said, we want an agreement that includes China. So the handful of Canadian reporters that were there got to him. Now, by the way, my badge that let me get into any room because I was representing Papua New Guinea did not let me get in the room where Peter Kent did his briefings because he held those in a hotel far from the convention site, and they had Environment Canada staff actually blocking the doors lest I try to charge them when they were not looking. <laughs> so I found out from the reporters afterwards that they, you know, they, they asked Peter Kent, now that China is saying that it will take on targets, which is what you want, as long as there's a second commitment period under Kyoto, does that change your position? For which his answer was one word, no. So what happened then was at least it became really even more critical for there to be a second commitment period under Kyoto because we were negotiating on two tracks, the Kyoto Protocol track, which includes all countries except the United States, and the Framework Convention on Climate Change track, on which the United States is still involved. So we're dealing with the 1992 agreement, the 1997 agreement. The 1997 agreement didn't come into legal force till 2005. Lots of work to do to catch up. So the Framework Convention on Climate Change track was called the Long-Term Cooperative Arrangements. It got short, short form to LCA. It was launched in 2005 in Montreal. The second commitment period under Kyoto also launched in Canada in 2005, and they've been moving along disastrously. You know, you make a little bit of progress in Bali with a Bali roadmap, then you have to take a few steps back because Poznan and Poland was a disaster, then you go a little bit farther. Copenhagen was where it had to happen, and everything blew up, got back on track, at least a bit, thanks to the Mexican government in 2010 in Cancun at COP16, and here we are at COP17, can we save the Kyoto Protocol, or is it, and the South African government did a great job. The African continent, the countries of Africa did a great job. They said, we will not let the Kyoto Protocol die on African soil. If Kyoto dies, we die. There's a very strong degree of emotion around why countries that are already facing extreme drought followed by extreme flooding, countries of the low-lying island states like Tuvalu and the Maldives that see that even with existing levels of emissions, they're not sure they can survive. And they sure know they won't survive if we keep ratcheting them up. So in the negotiations in Durban, against all odds, because we had Canada not only refusing our, to get involved ourselves in a second commitment period. We've done a lot to try to encourage other countries to join us. So Japan and Russia came on board with Canada to say no second commitment period. But European Union fought really hard, and the South African chair of the conference worked round the clock, and a lot of countries really put their oar in to help. Brazil did a great job. India showed more flexibility than Canada, but it was still a sticking point with India that held us two full days after when the conference was supposed to end. It was supposed to have ended Friday night. It ended in the wee hours of Sunday morning. So what was accomplished? Well, the, it's a good news, bad news story. Gwyn Dyer calls Durban the suicide pact for the planet. And he's not off, not wrong, if all we ever accomplished was this long-term agreement side, which is what Peter Kent celebrates and what Stephen Harper says is fine. Because what it says is on a long-term track, all the countries that got involved with the bogus Copenhagen Accord, which, by the way, was not the product of negotiation in the UN conference in Copenhagen. It was a side deal, uh, sort of like a, a you know, shoot out at high noon, you know, Barack Obama saying, meet me behind the bar, we got to talk. You know, it was a very small group to say, this is our approach and we're going to make these, these promises which are politically binding. Can you imagine anything less likely to be binding? So 
the Copenhagen Accord is not a real agreement, didn't come out of the UN system, but they've kind of been bootstrapping it in, and they're trying to get those principles into this long-term framework piece. So the long-term framework now says, out of Durban, that the countries of the convention will agree to their targets by 2015 and make them legally binding by 2020. Now, that is a suicide pact for the planet. That's game over. That's shooting so far past the tipping points in the atmosphere that we've been warned of repeatedly. We cannot allow global temperatures, on average, to increase two degrees Celsius above what they were before the Industrial Revolution. We can't. We, at that point, start a self-accelerating process of runaway global warming, which really imperils human civilization, for sure, may, at its worst-case scenario, convert planet Earth, which is, you know, nice from outer space, being blue and green and nice, to looking like Venus and being like Venus. So we don't want to, that's a hypothetical, not likely at all, but losing human civilization, that's really on the cards right now unless we get our act together. So that's the, the framework convention side. In exchange for that weak pile of horrible agreements, we have the Kyoto Protocol side, which is where the EU really went to the wall and where the developing countries and the low Long Island states went to the wall to get a second commitment period under Kyoto to begin January 1, 2013, with the countries that have signed on collectively committing to 25 to 40 percent reductions below 1990 levels by either 2017 or 2020 yet to be determined. The countries that have signed on are the European Union nations plus a handful of others, Kazakhstan, Norway, um, yeah, obviously, most of the Scandinavian countries are already in the EU, plus Australia, New Zealand, but not Russia, Canada, or Japan, and not the United States, because it's not a party of the Kyoto Protocol. And the U.S. position in Durban was outrageous from the get-go, and all you could say is uh, it's because of the U.S. politics. Everyone around the world knows that U.S. politics made the U.S. delegation State Department head of Dell start the meeting by saying, we believe that at the end of the first commitment period under Kyoto, the world needs a period of reflection. I, was, I, I wrote in my blog, it's like, you know, back to the Titanic, it's like having the crew of the Titanic say, instead of getting in the lifeboats, we're going to have a yoga class. <laughs> but there's enough good countries on board and they are committed, and it's enough of a, of, a, of a signal of bona fides that India, China, and Brazil are now talking more seriously about when they will agree to emission reduction targets. They have not agreed to them yet. Uh, nothing could be more helpful for the Kyoto Protocol and getting China, India, and Brazil to take on targets than for Canada to withdraw the letter we sent. Now, that brings me back to Canada. I t I've taken a little bit longer than I meant to, but I need to cover this part. Uh, I told you about the CTV story, and I told you about the room I couldn't get into. I need to tell you about another briefing. Peter Kent was asked by Canadian reporters well, because he'd met with Christina Figueres. Christina Figueres is the leading UN uh, official in charge of the climate process. There is a secretariat in Bonn for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It has a head official who runs the process. It used to be a Dutchman named Ivo de Boer. He stepped down after Copenhagen. His term was up, and so were his wits. At that point, he was at his wits' end. And Cristina Figueres took over from Costa Rica. And it was widely reported through the corridors that Peter Kent had met with Cristina Figueres and reassured her that Canada had no intention of withdrawing from the Kyoto Protocol. The Canadian reporters went to Peter Kent afterwards in the room that I couldn't get into and asked him if this was at long last an official denial of the story that CTV ran. And he said to the journalist, oh, no, I didn't tell her we weren't going to withdraw. I just told her she need fear no unpleasant surprises this week in Durban. Now, sometimes I would ask myself, is there any earthly point in me flying all that way as intensely guilty as I am about any carbon emissions and flying at all, to be at a, convent, at a conference where I can't influence my own government because I'm with Papua New Guinea. And I'm thinking, the one thing that I feel sure was worth bringing back as information was, I, and of course I love seeing the global greens, that's like that family reunion on the Titanic thing, so every day 
the parliamentarians from around the world who, rep who are Green Party members from Finland and Belgium and Germany and, and we were from all over the world and Australia. And there were a lot of Greens there and we tried to meet every day to exchange information, which was handy because the Green, the Green Party, well, the Minister of Environment for Finland and Belgium, they're both Greens, so they had good information better than the rest of ours because they were in every smallish room. And in one of those sessions where we were just in a little gathering, Christina Figueres spotted one of the Greens, who was an old friend of hers, and came over to say hello. And I had to ask her. I said, I'm a Canadian member of Parliament, and I just want to know, what did our Minister of Environment tell you when he met with you? And she said, oh, she said. She was very, she's very elegant, she, immaculate. I don't know how she didn't look stressed at this point in the convention. She said, oh, she said, everything's fine. He completely reassured me that Canada is is going to stay in the Kyoto Protocol, no intention to legally withdraw. And I said, he told the Canadian press that all he told you was expect no unpleasant surprises this week. I still think we're going, they're going to legally withdraw. She looked like I'd hit her with a ton of bricks. I mean, you read body language, you read things. You, she just crumpled. She said, no, 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 no. It's not what he told me. So I'm so offended to be represented by a government that would deliberately mislead senior UN officials. And then the day we got back, I mean, we hadn't even been back, I don't know how long his feet had been on Canadian soil. And I don't really blame Peter Kemp. This is all Stephen Harper. He draws all the, he sets out the orders, the, the, he wrote, you know, the PMO wrote Joe Oliver's crazy letter about foreign radicals. All these things are directed by one person. But Peter Kemp was back on Canadian soil, not very long at all, when he held a press conference and said that we were withdrawing from the Kyoto Protocol legally. And he made it sound like we'd already withdrawn. And he said if we didn't do so, we'd end up owing $14 billion, or at least it sounded like he said that. You had to listen to the tape very carefully afterwards to realize that what he'd said was the compliance costs of Kyoto would be $14 billion. Reality is there are no enforcement provisions in the Kyoto Protocol that require us to spend a dime if we stay in, even if we're out of compliance. Japan staying in, not taking on a second commitment period. I believe we should be in and take on a second commitment period. And frankly, we could negotiate one that would be as weak as the government's current targets, which they say they will live up to. The last point on all of this being, we have not yet withdrawn from the Kyoto Protocol. We have sent a letter of intent to withdraw, which will take effect in December 2012. So we have some time here. We don't have much time. In terms of what's happening to the atmosphere, we're out of time. But as Canadians, we have an obligation not only to ourselves and our children and, and our, our country, but we have some clout here to improve the situation for global negotiations by withdrawing that letter this year. Otherwise, we will be remembered as a country that was as villainous, reckless, rogue, and unhelpful as anything you can imagine in the annals of human history. And that's not the Canada I love. That is not us. That's not us as a people that we would destroy the chances of future generations to have life? Because what? Because we didn't really know that we could really confront the leader of the Conservative Party who got 39% of the 60% of the people that voted? In other words, we, we really don't have time to wait for the next election to change Canadian policy. We have to do it this year. We have to figure out a way to do it. It starts by realizing that sometimes really bad leadership that doesn't represent the people who elected it can choose to go like Gordon Campbell or be forced out by people in their own party like Dalton Camp did to Diefenbaker. In other words, we should not presume that the status quo politically is what we're stuck with. We should encourage each other, that's where I started from, inform each other and get the word out. So with that, I want to stop and be sure to have some time to talk to you, find out what's on your minds, and thank you all for your interest in this issue. Thanks, Elizabeth.
Okay, I know there are probably a number of questions and we want to try, this is what we do with Carbon Talks and PICS, this is our session, we try and have as many questions as we can. We normally stop right at 1.30 to make sure you can get out, but I heard at the beginning that you'd be willing to go yeah, a few I'm, minutes earlier, a few minutes later. No, so can I'm, we went sure to quarter I'm fine two? To 1:45. Okay, so we're going to go to 1:45, and those that have to leave, if you wouldn't mind exiting out one of the doors just quietly. We're going to go to 1:45 today. For those of you that are tweeting, the hashtag is hashtag Carbon Talks, um, and we've also had PICS, our our partner, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, webcasting this, and I believe there may even be Twitter questions coming in. So what I want to do is take three questions right now. Um, Elizabeth is good with. Group Grouping them so we get to hear from a few of you. Paul, the woman in the front row, and one more. There we go. So one, two, three. If you could keep your questions very brief so we can get as many questions in as possible. Paul. Krista Kirste, it may not be uh, that much related, but anyway, your encouragement that we have to do something as Canadians, I would like to mention the CETA, mm -hmm. the Canadian European Comprehensive Trade Agreement, which Harper will sign with the European uh, corporations in uh, other secrecy uh, uh, this coming spring sometime. And right now, he is in Davos to uh, confer with the top-notch industrialists, so the top 1%. And he said this morning on the national mm -hmm. radio that he is going to cut all red tape in order to get the oil uh, industry or the pipelines going. So this is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes. And, oh, I would like to mention the CETA agreement, uh, <coughs> for people who don't know here, it is the most deplorable agreement and most dangerous agreement which a, a Canadian government has ever signed. It means privatization of everything we Canadians own. Okay, thank uh, you, Mrs. So Christensen. So, and, and hopefully you'll have a chance to speak to that. Your name and your question, please. Robert. Um, so I guess my question uh, comes around getting your message out. Like, uh, I know you were, uh, there was resistance to having you in the debate. Um, and, and, you know, if I talk to friends, they say, oh, the Green Party is flaky. Um, I don't really believe that environment's a real issue. I wonder if you can comment on how to get your message to greater Canadians. Okay. Well, thank you for the cluster of questions. I think they, they don't cluster terribly well, but they, they kind of... <laughs> Um, I, the legal challenge is important because it keeps a focus on the issue. I don't want to prejudge how it will be. My initial response when uh, Peter Kent said we were legally withdrawing was to raise the issue of the Kyoto Implementation Act, which was passed under the, uh, during the years that Harper has been Prime Minister, but when they were in minority, and the Act got all the way through the House and the Senate and has royal assent and requires that we meet our Kyoto obligations. So we'll leave it to the court to decide. It's going to be uphill, frankly but it will be uh, an important way of keeping focus on the issue, and I've, Daniel Turp knows that he has my full support. Uh, for Krista's question, yeah, the, the uh, Canadian economic, the comprehensive economic trade agreement with Europe is very dangerous. The, the elements of it that are the worst, well, there's some, the bad ones from Europe are the ones that are dictated to the Europeans by their pharmaceutical industry. The ones that are the worst from the Canadian side have to do with bringing uh, investor state provisions in Chapter 11 to European nations' ability to sue us, as well as American corporations' ability to sue us. So the ability of a corporation to sue a democratically elected government for its sense of uh, loss of expectation of profits is one of the most corrosive things to democracy that we've ever allowed. They're no longer trade agreements, of course. These are really much larger political agreements that shift power from democratically elected governments to corporations. Uh, so. I certainly oppose CETA. Ironically, one of the reasons CETA may not get passed in the European Parliament is that so many countries are now so angry at Canada for so many things, um, including what we've done about Kyoto, our 
unrepentant defense of asbestos, which has lost us a lot of friends in Europe, and the seal hunt. So when you add those things up, we may not have the votes to see CETA pass. Uh, the very worrying statements from the Harper uh, people that they want to eliminate red tape, go for efficiency. I've seen this coming for some time. They have been attacking the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency and its work and the reality of assessments ever since they came to power. They've cut the budget of the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency already by 40%. And in the Budget Implementation Act of 2010, when they couldn't get their own way as they can now just by bulldozing things through the commons because they've got the votes, uh, they used to put really un unpopular measures and attach them to the budget. And that's how they took all energy projects away from the jurisdiction of the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act and moved them to being responsibilities of the regulatory bodies. So for pipelines, the National Energy Board. For nuclear plants, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Those agencies now have primary responsibility for environmental assessments. So it's not much of a leap to see them saying, okay, well, since the NEB is doing it, right now the NEB hearing on the Enbridge supertanker scheme is being run by the NEB, but with a process that was created under the Environmental Assessment Act. And that's why we have public meetings, a panel review, and so on. And the attack on that process, I think, is one of the most chilling things. Uh, today's news, and this was just passed to me before I took, uh, took the mic, is uh, information that was found through access to information of notes on meetings within the Government of Canada, copies of minutes obtained under access to information legislation between high-ranking federal officials, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, and the former PMO official, Bruce Carson, uh, who, of course, we won't get, we won't go there. Um, but just to get this, this was a, a meeting in which um, the oil industries were referred to as "quote unquote" like-minded allies, and the adversaries and enemies of Canada were referred to were, of course, environmental groups. The attack it, that has been leveled of trying to equate the interests of multinational oil companies with Canada's national interest without any discussion of how that could be the case. You know, why would we export raw crude to other countries before we, for instance, process it in Canada? Why do we import 55% of the oil we use because Eastern Canada doesn't have access to the oil? Why would we ignore all our climate targets given that reality instead of having a moratorium on the tar sands growth, refining the crude that we're getting, which would maximize the jobs while shipping out less oil, we would also improve the economic climate for manufacturing pulp and paper. There's a large issue here, which is under the rubric of Dutch disease. And rather than explain it now, just go home or right now on your BlackBerry, Google Dutch disease, and that's what I'm talking about, which is that the growth of the tar sands has been bad for the Canadian economy. No one wants to talk about it. We had 340,000 jobs lost in manufacturing and pulp and paper and so on because of the growth of oil sands oil barrels, we're now at 1.8 million barrels of oil a day that we're shipping out as bitumen crude. That's not really an energy policy. It's not in Canada's national interest. And we're not allowed to have a discussion of whether it's in our national interest because it's being branded right now as anti-Canadian to even ask these questions. All right? So we have to, yes, I'm, I'm looking, I, I, Valerie Langer was quoted in today's Globe and Mail. I don't know how many of you know Valerie, but as a founder of Forest Ethics, she was quoted as saying that the, um, the sto Andrew Frank story, which of course got him fired, that PMO officials referred to Forest Ethics as enemies of Canada, which led to the Tides Foundation. This is his allegation. Who knows? I wasn't in the room at PMO, and neither was Andrew Frank. But uh, the allegation is that uh, Tides Canada was told that the money they were providing to Forest Ethics was seen as, as unhelpful to national interests, and they applied pressure on them to pressure Forest Ethics to quiet its criticism of uh, the expansion of the tar sands and the pipelines and the oil tankers. And Valerie's comment was, there's something about this whole thing that strikes me as McCarthy-like. You know, I had a son an image of a parliamentary committee, the House Committee on Anti-Canadian Activities. Have you now or at any time in the past been a member of Greenpeace? <laughs> have, have you ever done any, have you ever recycled? You know, they want to, we <laughs> Uh, for this, I just recommend you look up Rick Mercer's rant on, on foreign radicals. And uh, we need to laugh at it, but it's also pretty scary. And so you had the last one, and that was, oh, 
Yeah, well, the debate, I wasn't, there wasn't just resistance. There was a cabal of the five media executives who make the decision without any criteria, without any rules, and the leaders of the other parties who said, we don't want her there. So that's, uh, Andrew Coyne nailed it. He said it's like having uh, a meeting between advertisers, I mean, between the networks, and the uh, CEOs from Ford and GM and Chrysler saying, from now on, there'll be no more ads for Toyota. Well, I don't know. I, if you look at the polls, the majority of Canadians and polls taken right after Peter Kent's announcement still favor Kyoto. If you look at the polls more recently, the majority of Canadians say they're more worried about foreign, foreign ownership in the oil sands than they are about foreign donations to environmental groups. The message is reaching many, many people, but the impression is created by the same cabal, particularly the fact that we have a very small number of media outlets owned by a very small number of people, that there is no issue, it's not important. But we know it's important. So that's why I'm asking each of you to become a town crier in your own sphere and get on, write letters to the editor and go on these crazy websites, whatever you can do. And by crazy websites, I mean CBC, CTV, Global. <laughs> uh, I mean, they, they're hard because they're, they're populated with so many paid trolls that it's an unpleasant experience to go there. But you've got to keep trying to get the truth out because we have to make sure that most Canadians know that we are, in fact, most Canadians. So more time? It's clear with Elizabeth you can go from international trade policy to, to what's going on in debate. So we, we're getting you on so many different issues. So I want to open it up again to three more questions. One, two, and a third one, three. So go ahead. Do you want to give us your name as well so we have a chance to get to know you? Alex. Alex Boston, East Atlantic Gold. Um, you said something that's really germane on the short term for withdrawal, for defeating the withdrawal from Kyoto, but I think it's also really important on a longer term how do we advance the, the climate protection agenda. As, and it was about socialism. And, uh, and it is it's, it's quite unique that in North America you can predict you know, the, the base of a party more accurately around um, climate change sexuality or religion or uh, gender or anything else. Like, it's where you sit on climate change which will determine if you're the base in the, in the Conservatives or another party in Canada or Republican or Dems in the, in, in the U.S. And you flip across the Atlantic and you know, Merkel and Sarkozy and um, Cameron certainly ain't socialists. And what we do have to do in this country is break this partisan And we have one more. My question yeah, your, your name is? Biba. Biba.
Okay, okay, I'm going to try to get through these. I'm aware of... Okay, we're good. We got a good... Okay. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. Because these answers were the best ones, so it's a shame you're leaving. <laughs> so I'm just being bad. I'm just kidding you. You got all the good stuff. Thank you. Um, okay. Is it more expensive to build refineries in Alberta? You bet. It's prohibitively expensive. You can't do it. That's why they don't. Guess why? Because we don't regulate the expansion of the tar sands. If we put a moratorium on expansion of the tar sands, we could afford to build refineries there. It's what Peter Lougheed calls the traffic jam. It's created by a hyperinflationary bubble. If any of you ever have known, how many of you have friends who've ever worked in Fort McMurray or have some sense of what they pay there, right? Try to imagine finding a workforce to build a refinery at those pay rates, right? I mean, they, I was talking to people in Fort McMurray at a, a community roundtable uh, not long ago, and they said it's really hard to hang on to school teachers because they get to Fort McMurray and they quit their school teacher job to go work in the tar sands because the money's better. Same thing for new RCMP officers. Quit to drive a truck. The money's better. Uh, to qualify for low-income housing in Fort McMurray, and this is, figure's a few years old, so it's probably changed and gotten higher, but to qualify for low-income housing in Fort McMurray, you have to earn $60,000 a year or less. In other words, it's an economy that's nuts, and you can't get the capital, and you can't get the workforce, and that's why it's cheaper for the oil industry to spend $6 billion to pipe bitumen crude, and with it, 40,500 Canadian jobs, according to the Communications, Energy, and Paper Workers Union, direct and indirect jobs, over 40,000 jobs go with that crude to refineries located along the Texas coast of the Gulf of Mexico because they have excess capacity. And speaking of capacity, we have more than enough pipelines for the total capacity of the tar sands as of now, and God bless you, leading up to, unless we expand them by more than 150%. In other words, once we've tripled the current level of production, there will be a capacity problem, and they might like more pipelines, assuming they never process it here. This is madness. And if we wanted to reduce, so if we wanted to get our economy, which is your next question, how come the jobs were lost? The Dutch disease issue, which is called Dutch disease because it happened first in the Netherlands when they discovered North Sea oil. They went crazy over it. People usually do. It's like catnip or a gold rush or something. Everyone goes nuts. And they discovered, which they hadn't expected, they thought it would be all good news. But the value of the gilder kept rising. And with that, their export-based industries collapsed. So manufacturing collapsed. Other, other sectors of the economy suffered. And that's why economists call it Dutch disease. I first came across the term when I was reading the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which is a pretty right-wing group, the OECD Advice to Canada for Our Economy in 2008. And it said Canada has Dutch disease. So I decided I should read that. And it said that we should have a carbon tax and slow the growth in the tar sands so that we could improve our economic situation. I tried to raise this issue in the debate I got in. And I figured Stephen Harper's an economist, allegedly. He'll know what Dutch disease is. But it was very hard to engage on actual issues of that type. But that's why we lose jobs. Some economists who, who were quoted in a report I saw that was prepared by the Library of Parliament estimate that for every job created in the Athabasca region, another job is lost elsewhere in Canada. Well, isn't it Adrian Carr, the Green Party member of the Vancouver City Council, as I live and breathe? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, and Alex Boston, your question. Actually, I want to, we have this, you're right about the general nature of this issue. But the conservative base, I do not believe, is as anti-Kyoto as your question suggested. And I'll tell you why I'm pretty sure of it. I'm in the House of Commons, I see the bills come across, and I hear the rhetoric that I heard in the election campaign. Kill the long gun registry. Get rid of the wheat board. Tough on crime, put those kids in jail. All that stuff. And that's coming at us in legislation. You will know that we never once heard in the election campaign, kill Kyoto. Didn't hear it. Why? Because it wouldn't work for his base, and he knows it. For climate, what we heard was... We have to be responsible and act in a way that responds to the climate change issue. 
in a way that respects our economic activity. In other words, he, he, did not, he was not above board on his plans for Kyoto. I knew what they were. Other people knew what they were. So I don't think it's in the same sense a partisan issue, although it's clear that Stephen Harper, as a climate denier, which also explains why it is that Biba, he has children and doesn't want to do a single solitary thing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, either in Canada or globally. He doesn't think it's true. I can't find a single scientist. I know most of the scientists who work on climate change in Canada, and I used to work at Environment Canada, so I know a lot of the ones who've been there for donkey's years and don't go on radio or TV. I keep asking everyone, have, do, have you ever personally, or do you know of any scientist personally, who's ever briefed Stephen Harper on the climate crisis? I can't find one. I can tell you from being in the House that a lot of conservative members of Parliament agree with us. They understand the climate issue. They're not deniers. There's, a, there's a, an alarming number who are climate deniers. I'm not saying that's not the case. Maxime Bernier has been on the record publicly saying there's nothing to the climate crisis. It's all invented by, you know, anyone who knows scientists can see exactly how true this is. You know, really clever conspiracy of scientists trying to run a global network to fool everybody and out communicate the oil industry. Yeah, that's scientists for you. That's a, <laughs> see their fingerprints all over that. I mean, unless, unless, I was going to, what, it, we can't use the word ept, we have inept. A less competent group of liars you will find, because scientists don't lie. They just talk about their research, and they're not really skilled communicators. But anyway, uh, they, none of them have briefed Stephen Harper on climate. I believe he's a climate denier. And that's why he has this hate on for Kyoto. He does see it as a socialist scheme. Uh, I talked once at length with another member of his party when I was at Sierra Club, and he had an environment critic who was a really good guy who talked to me about these things. But he said, well, you'll never get Stephen to say that he'll support Kyoto, because this guy really wanted to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I was saying, look, why don't you just say your party will meet Kyoto targets? The liberals haven't done it. You could do it. Your plans are good. So I was trying to encourage him. And he said, oh, no, no. Stephen will never support Kyoto. And I said, well, I don't, what? He said, he'll always see it as one of those UN things. Yeah. Okay, so that's why we're not on the Security Council to throw in for good measure. So <laughs> there, is, there is not a left, right, and center issue. It is not about his base. His base includes a lot of people who are grandparents who are really worried. And his caucus includes people who, by the way, one of them, Michael Chong, actually is very brave because we formed, since I got elected, we formed an all-party climate caucus. This is one of the reasons I know conservatives are interested and engaged because we have briefing sessions and we invite all parliamentarians and we get conservatives to come. And I've had lots of private conversations with members of parliament. They're not, you know, they hated as a group to all vote that asbestos was safe. They hated it. They knew it was wrong. They felt, one of them said to me, I've I, I got to go home now and have a shower because I've never felt so dirty in my life. It was heartbreaking to see a room full of members of parliament whose first allegiance should be to the people who elected them. But because our system, this is a whole other rant, but political parties have way too much power in this country, all of them, if I could improve democracy, Adrian may kill me, but it wouldn't hurt to, ab to abolish political parties, flat out get rid of them, because they are obstructing Canadian democracy just as they have polluted and destroyed any notion of the founding fathers' nation of, notion of democracy in the United States. We have a polluted, crazed system run by backroom boys who fit a character profile no matter what party they're in, no matter what ideology they think they believe in. It's a small group of people who really are uh, sociopaths. They love figuring out how to win. They love getting the other guy. They love running ruthless message tracks. And they're not the people who run for office, but they run the people who run for office. I'm going to ask for a couple more questions, and before I do that, I am going to ask a Durbin question. Because this was on Durbin, I want to, I'm really pleased that you've been answering the questions that people have been asking, so this is not a criticism about the questions at all, but I do want to ask a Durbin question. Um, we saw in Copenhagen some really international blocks forming that seemed that they couldn't move, and I'd like to get your sense of the blocks and how they've moved and, and where you think the potential for real changes on international climate policy. And we had Stéphane Dion here 
just before Durban, and he talked about potentially looking at mechanisms through the G20 as well to strengthen, and we wanted to get your impressions of that. So that's one question. Uh, Gordon, I saw your hand up first, and I believe I, there we go, and one back in there. So one, two, three, and if you could just introduce yourself, and we are going to use the mic because I apologize, we have a webcast and we want to ensure, and there's another mic, but we've got, we'll get you, we'll get you the mics. Go ahead, Gordon. Thanks, Gord Price, SFU City Program. That was a tour de force, Elizabeth. That was impressive. So I try to choose my words carefully here in the question. If and when it seems credible and probable that civilizational suicide is likely, what is the appropriate and rational thing for a young person to do? Hi, Vanessa Timmer from One Earth. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, leading on from what you were saying, what happened at Copenhagen from your perspective? Okay, okay I'm going to lump Vanessa. Oh, there's another We're going to take Sorry. one more. I was thinking three, including yours. I'm but adding may, one more because oh, this okay. may be no, the last good, grouping. Good. Yeah, it's good. Thanks. Um, I'm Winnie Ho from the Davis Suzuki Foundation. I um, want to ask the China question. The Prime Minister is going to China next month, uh, in actually about two weeks. And... Uh, there are a lot of reports, news reports, talking about um, they're going to sign a whole bunch of uh, agreements, contracts to sell more Canadian oil. And in the Chinese media, it seems like uh, China is very willing buyer of these oil. So, but at the same time, China is also um, the world's top renewable energy investment country. So how do we deal with this China factor in Canada? Okay, so those, those all, all those questions really relate to the global negotiations of carbon talks. Gordon's is the hardest, so I'll try to leave it for last. Um, Shauna's question and Vanessa's questions are, are quite related. Um, the process of blocks and negotiations, and forgive me, I'm going to do this relatively quickly, but I, I, I think it's important to see the way the world is changing. Back in 1972, which may be too far back for you guys to want to go, but that was the first UN conference on environment, and it was in Stockholm. And there was a boycott by developing countries. There was a pushback that said, you rich countries want to talk about pollution, but we're starving, so we're not interested. Brazil was one of those countries that boycotted. Um, Indira Gandhi was one of the only leaders of the, develop of the developing world who attended Stockholm. Go to 92 in Rio, you had a different scenario. It was hugely symbolic that Brazil, that had boycotted in 72, hosted in 92. That was seen as a real shift. The developing world was there fully. That's one of the best speeches I've ever heard was Fidel Castro's, sharing a stage with George Bush. It wasn't your average event. <laughs> of course. So what happened at Rio was called the Rio Bargain. The developing world was still basically saying, this environmental stuff, this pollution, this is your issue in the north. We're still dealing with poverty. I saw everything shift in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen, the developing world was saying, you can't buy us off with money, you bastards. Right? The head of the delegation from Tuvalu, when offered that there was going to be a $100 billion adaptation fund, said, in biblical terms, you're offering us 30 pieces of silver for our children's future. Our children's future is not for sale. It became African delegations walking out of negotiations in Copenhagen saying 1.5 to stay alive. It's because the global figure of it gets too high at 2 degrees. For many countries in the world, 2 degrees is way too high. 1.5 to stay alive, 2 degrees is suicide, 3 degrees is genocide. Chanted the African delegates. Everything's shifted. So you now have small, poor countries calling out rich developing countries. You have Papua New Guinea, Tuvalu, criticizing China for not taking on targets in Copenhagen. You have a complete realignment such that the European Union, usually seen as an elite, elite group of wealthy countries, was in lock, solid block in Durban with Africa, low-lying island states, least developed countries, and the outliers were the United States, Canada, of course, the worst, Ch you know, and China played a very interesting role. Getting to your point, Willie, China's role became we're more flexible than the others. 
One thing about China is they know that climate change is real. They see it as a threat. Their leadership understands, and they are pouring, as you said, hundreds of billions of dollars into renewable energy. They're also pouring at least some billions into owning our resources in Alberta without any questions asked by anyone. So there's now about $20 billion worth of, they completely own the Fort Mackay project that's 100% owned by Chinese Communist Party government interests. Right? And we're the foreign radicals? <laughs> this is a very interesting dynamic. But I, I look to China with its complex, very complex. There are lots of things influencing what the Chinese government has to deal with in terms of trying to deal with a huge, huge geography with a rising middle class, higher expectations, yes, its own first world elite within the country, many, many poor, and trying to say, okay, we know that climate change is a real threat. I think what may be going on within the, the very small group that runs the country is, at what point do we have enough renewables that we, sh that we just turn coal off? Because they're talking about, in a few years' time, we'll take on our targets. Well, how many years' time? Meanwhile, what happened in Copenhagen, besides this alliance, Vanessa, of some of the poorest in the South with some of the conscience of the North, uh, that alliance is very interesting. But what went wrong in Copenhagen was the um, combination of the failure of the U.S. To, to really be prepared to take on the U.S. Congress. So Copenhagen was used by Barack Obama for purely internal, inside the beltway politics to come up with something that would look good for public relations purposes to try to get through the perfectly useless Waxman-Markey bill, which he then pulled anyway. So that contaminated the process. The, the, the details on this you can find in a new book by William Marsden called Fool's Rule about global climate negotiations. But my sense that when I was there, and I wrote a lot of blogs and I wrote articles after the fact because it made me angry that people were blaming China. It was really clear to me being there on the ground that the Danish government had messed this up from the get-go and had, they suspended civil liberties in Copenhagen. They made it really hard to get into the convention. You had to wait outside in Ottawa-type freezing weather for hours, and sometimes they'd lock out the Chinese delegation by accident. They forgot to invite the Chinese to the dinner meeting after, they were having a meeting after the heads of state dinner, after the dinner the queen was hosting. The important countries were supposed to meet Thursday night, and when everyone got in the room, they realized, where's China? They forgot to invite them, they weren't sure. Um, it goes to the fact that Chinese Prime Minister at that point, uh, Rasmussen, hated Connie Heidegger, who was his Minister of Environment. She understood UN systems involved developing consensus and that you can't do anything in a non-transparent way. You have to work with everyone, bring forward agreements that are transparent. Rasmussen thought he could pull a deal together by talking to what he thought of as the countries that counted, have a secret text. The, reve the revelation of the secret text on the first day of the Copenhagen meeting contaminated everything. There was no trust. It was a horrible, horrible meeting. And Connie Heidegger left Danish politics right after. And she's now the lead climate negotiator for the European Union. And she was the one who held so firm in Cancun and in Durban that we not allow the Kyoto Protocol to die. Your last question. I can't answer a hypothetical that's based on a situation which we must never allow to happen. We cannot ever allow ourselves to advise at our age what a young person should do if we continue to fail. We are in our generation, those of us over 50, absolutely honor bound, morally bound, ethically bound to get this right in the time we have. We still have some time. And we must ensure that Canada re-engage in Kyoto. We can do that. We're 30 million smart people, and he's only one guy. We shouldn't be so afraid of him. 30 million to one. It's a really good odds. I'm serious about we have to have Stephen Harper leave. He's really in the way on a whole bunch of good things that even other people in his party would do. So I think it's time to really face our obligations and not for a minute say, what would a person do? I mean, I grew up in the shadow of the mushroom cloud. There were a lot of people who thought we faced annihilation through nuclear war and nuclear winter. We made it not happen. We can make this as much as it is a proximate near-term threat. We can drive it back and we can shift. We have to. We can't ask a young person to even begin to th contemplate your question. I know it's a serious question. I know you're not wrong to think that we're near that point, but we're not there yet. And we have to, for the, for our, for the young people in this room, 
We're not giving up on our future collectively together. Humanity does learn, and there are a lot of countries pulling in the right direction. We are citizens of one of the worst countries on this issue. Therefore, it's our obligation to wrestle our government to the ground if it's required in a very nice way through a, you know, proper diplomacy. Maybe we'll get Stephen Harper to change his mind. It's always possible. He hasn't yet, but on, you know, on some things, perhaps. We can, maybe we reach him through his children. Maybe we get scientists to brief him. Maybe members of his caucus get him and tell him it has to be done. But we should not accept that we're powerless in a situation when our government is a significant factor in blocking global progress.